right? It's time to start editing our Python files. And exactly how you go about doing that is going to vary uh, a lot depending upon what your uh, experience is. Uh, there are several different uh, editors that are available on the supercomputer. Um, uh, VI, uh, Vim is, is one of the old standards, as is Emacs. Um, one that's a little bit easier to use is called Nano. And so I provided Nano with the name of the file that I want, wanted to be editing. And you can see uh, that we have a, a file here that uh, is partially built. We're going to end up filling in uh, some, uh, some key pieces uh, just so we're all on the same page in terms of the, the key uh, components. Uh, for, for Nano, uh, you'll, you can actually see where there are some uh, some key bindings here. The, the, the caret means control. So in particular, control X means exit. If you have made a change to the file, then it will actually prompt you to save it. So, so I just made one small space change there and now I'm going to hit uh, control X and you can see it's asking whether or not to save the modified buffer. And by answering yes, then, uh, then it will ask what file name and here it's just giving you the 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 original file and, and it's fine to overwrite that file so uh, i'm just going to hit uh, enter here so nano is a, a reasonable place to to be working um, my preference is actually emacs so i'm going to be working over there but either one uh, uh, is certainly viable one of the nice things about emacs is that it does uh, do uh, coloring uh, of the code to to make it a little bit easier to read. All right, so some of this code should look familiar. Uh, so this function here, this build model function, we have uh, we talked about uh, uh, as we were working in Colab. So if you want to understand how that's uh, developed, go back to to those previous videos. Uh, but in summary, what this uh, does is it creates a fully connected network that has some number of inputs, some number of hidden units in the single uh, hidden layer, and then some number of output units. And you can specify what the uh, activation uh, function should be for uh, all of the uh, outputs, or, sorry, all of the, the hidden and output units. All right, so so we build that network. Um, there's also a an optimizer that we parameterize, uh, and then model.compile uh, binds those two things together along with a loss function. And here I have hard coded uh, mean squared error, but in practice, when we construct more general versions of build model, we'll actually have uh, things like the loss function be a, a parameter that we can pass it. Okay, so, so hopefully this looks familiar. Um, what I'm going to do is go all the way down to the bottom of the file and we're, then we're going to work our way back up. Um, but I, I, I wanted to talk about uh, uh, what happens uh, at the very beginning of execution of this program. So uh, in Emacs, it's a control V to, to get all the way down to the bottom. And this bit of uh, notation here is a little bit uh, funny in that uh, it, it's not something that we tend to see in, in other languages, at least in this particular format. Um, but uh, the way to read this is uh, if this particular Python file is actually being executed as opposed to being imported, then uh, we're going to detect that here if, if the name is main, uh, and then we'll start executing uh, what's within this, uh, this if block. Uh, what I'll do here is talk about the, the individual pieces within this function, and then we'll tear apart uh, a couple of them. Um, first off is uh, a component that is uh, all about being able to handle uh, arguments that are supplied at the command line. And these turn out to be incredibly useful in terms of being able to build very uh, general models that you can modify what their structure is or their behavior is 
uh, at the command line. And so there's a step of creating a parser. We have a function that does that up here. We'll work on in finishing up that implementation. Uh, and then uh, parser.parsargs actually goes out to uh, the, the set of command line arguments and, and does the, the parsing for us. Um, this is far superior to actually doing the parsing yourself. Uh, we're also going, in some cases, uh, in, in the deep learning context, we'll actually be running on nodes where there are GPUs. Uh, this, uh, this little bit here uh, asks uh, whether or not we should turn off the GPU. So um, this args variable here, this object comes from the parser. And uh, if this is uh, false, meaning we, uh, we don't want to use the GPU, then this bit is true, and then this bit of uh, code gets executed. And, and the, the, the uh, function of this uh, line of code is that it will actually turn off uh, uh, any access to the GPUs. This, this bit here, can run with or without the args.gpu, but this is all about detecting uh, the whether, whether there are GPUs and reporting that uh, information. This is helpful for some levels of debugging. So, but but exactly what's going on here is not so important for our purposes. Uh, and then the final line in, within this block is execute exp, uh, and we're handing our set of arguments to. Uh, to this particular function. Execute exp is something that we'll work on implementing up above. And that's actually where all the interesting work gets done. All right, so let's, let's talk through uh, creating of the parser. Um, what, what we do is uh, actually uh, uh, declare within this function the set of arguments that we're going to be accepting at the command line. And uh, for each of those arguments, we can say whether what, what the type of the argument is, is it an int, is it a float, is it a Boolean? Uh, we can also specify uh, default values. So this, this is just a constructor that, that creates that parser for us. And now what we're going to do is add uh, some lines to actually add arguments. So the operative uh, Method is parser.add argument. And uh, what we do is we specify the name of the argument. So I am going to first create one called uh, exp, uh, dash dash exp. Uh, and it's going to be type int. Uh, the default value is going to be zero. And you can also specify some help information. We'll look at how that works. So what I use this uh, experiment index uh, parameter for is uh, so that I can actually perform multiple experiments and have each one of them be numbered in a different way. So at the command line, let's actually look at what that would uh, look at look like here. I'm going to SSH over uh, to Schooner in a different shell. It's actually helpful to uh, to have multiple shells open at once. Okay, so I've I've CD'd over to that uh, directory. You can see that XOR base uh, is there. Um, this file is just a temporary file since I haven't saved uh, this this file here. Um, we'll talk about what this line means here in a second. But essentially, I'm setting up the right Python environment, and uh, and this allows us to do. Uh, something like this. So Python is the program we're going to be executing, and we are telling it which Python program to execute. Oops. Uh, and then we can add to that a uh, set of parameters. So here I can say I want to execute uh, exp5. And right now we haven't saved it, so uh, it uh, this particular Python program won't compile. We've got a few things we have to resolve before it'll actually work. Uh, but uh, what's nice about doing things in this way, so notice the dash dash exp here matches this dash dash exp. Um, 
the nice thing about doing things in this way is that this args object that we end up getting out of parse args, um, uh, it will actually have a set of properties that correspond to these names here that we can reference directly in code. And we'll, we'll see, we've seen one of those already. So here's args.gpu. We haven't added that yet, but we'll do that uh, very soon. Okay, so let's, let's go ahead and finish up adding our arguments. Um, the next thing I am going to do is uh, set up a parameter for epochs. This is the number of gradient descent steps we're going to take. And I'll set the default to 100. And the help string, help string will set, uh, I don't know, um, training epochs. Uh, it's also nice to be able to control the number of hidden units that, that we have. And I'll set the default to two. So once we have this all running, we can add to this, uh, to our command line, we can say hidden 10, and that will change our network over to once we set everything up right in our code, it'll change our network over to having a total of 10 hidden units. Okay, so let's go ahead and add our GPU. And, and this is just a little bit uh, different. Um, this is just a Boolean switch. Um, if it's specified, then we're going to store a true value in in uh, args.gpu uh, otherwise the implication here is that we'll have a, a a false value there and of course for our experiments right now we're not going to be using gpu so it won't in the end it won't matter but uh but in the long run it might be useful And I also like to have a, a, a switch called no-go. Uh, and what I mean by this is there are times where you're doing your debugging, you wanna make sure that everything works all the way from your argument parsing to building your network to loading your data, but you actually don't want to engage in any learning. And, and so that's what I use this no-go switch for. So it's also going to be a Boolean. All right, that just wrapped around a little bit. Okay, so uh, we have now added all the arguments that I'd like to have uh, here. So this creates the this parser object, and the last line, of course, we return that parser back to uh, to this level here. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and proceed backwards, uh, upwards through the code here. Um, I do have some code here that does do some, helps us with visualization. Um, I've actually left uh, display learning curve uh, incomplete right now. I'm just going to comment out this line so the Python code will actually compile. And then that leaves us with one uh, more piece here, get up to the top, which is this execute uh, exp uh, function that was at the very bottom of our main. And I, I use this as, uh, as the function, that's the top level control function that does the work of doing the experiment for us. And it does typically one experiment. So let's walk through this. Some of the pieces are uh, filled in, other pieces are not. Uh, some of this will look familiar given uh, what you've already done in CoLab. Uh, so the, the very first part here is, is actually setting up the data set. Um, so I have a variable uh, ins and another variable outs. Um, so this is setting up the NumPy arrays that control the set of inputs and outputs for our XOR problem. 
typically our data sets are much more interesting and complicated. Uh, so we tend not to just hard code them in our code, but uh, in this particular case, we're going to go ahead and do that. Uh, the next step is we want to build our model. And we've already talked about that particular uh, that particular function, we've looked at that, you have experience with it already. Uh, it takes as input number of inputs, number of hidden and number of output units, as well as an optional activation uh, uh, function. Um, in our case, uh, since we're solving binary problems, a sigmoid is a reasonable answer for this. Uh, number of input units, rather than hard coding that number here, I'm deriving it from the data. So ins.shape uh, gives us a tuple that is the shape of this NumPy array uh, that describes the, the shape. It, it is a tuple that describes the shape of the NumPy array. Element one of that tuple tells us how many input units we have, how many uh, columns do we have within this uh, input array. Um, so, so that automatically will fill in two in our case. Uh, args.hidden, this is an argument that we got from our parser. Uh, so we don't have to do anything special with that. And here we're inferring the number of output units. So outs.shape1 tells us how many columns we have in our output numpy array. Uh, in this case, it's one. OK, so that, that will construct our model. And so our, the model variable then is a reference to the model object. The next step that we want to take is uh, setting up our callbacks, and we'll talk we'll talk more later uh, about the details here. Um, sometimes we don't want to. So, so uh, one possibility when we're training a model is that we guess how many uh, epochs or number of steps we have to take in order to do the learning. Uh, and uh, in practice, from, from one run to another, the answer, the number that you actually need can be quite different. And, and so what we end up doing is tending to set that number of epochs pretty large and, uh, and then hoping that that number is uh, sufficient. But if we find a reasonable solution very early on, what we'd really like to do is have our learning system actually stop and just be done at that point. Um, so, uh, so that's what this early stopping callback is all about. We'll talk about these t details more, but I will summarize this in just a second. So patience is 100, restore best weights equals true, and min delta we're going to set to a pretty small number. OK, so, so um, patience, what it's going to do is uh, it's going to get to a point where it thinks it's at essentially the best solution. And the way we're detecting that is if uh, our uh, mean squared error has not changed by very much, we're going to call it done. Uh, but uh, there are lots of learning scenarios where uh, where we might flatten out for a little while, not make much progress, but then find a little bit more gradient to, to grab a hold of and continue learning. And what patience does is it says, if you think you've hit bottom uh, according to this criteria here, then we're going to, to execute 100 more steps. Uh, and uh, And if that is still true, if that bottom point was still the, the bottom, then we'll be done. Uh, otherwise, we'll keep going. Um, what restore best weights does is that uh, what, uh, what happens is that um, rather than stopping 100 steps past the bottom, it will uh, actually roll itself back to the, the best possible uh, set of uh, parameters, at least according to our uh, error metric. So that's a, a quick summary. We'll talk more about this later. OK, so next, next step is that um, uh, I like to be able to, uh, to name 
uh, a lot of my files and my documentation uh, according to uh, with information that describes the entire experiment. And so that's what this args to string function is doing. It takes it takes my set of arguments and based on at least a subset of those arguments, it returns a string that we're going to use for other things. You can take a look at what that function is up here. Um, so you'll notice just above e uh, execute exp is the definition of this. Um, you can see that it is creating a string that's exp underscore some two digit integer underscore hidden underscore some other two digit uh, integer. And what exactly gets used for those two is uh, determined by, by these two things. So the exp number uh, and the number of hidden units. And this way we, we can actually use this to name our output files. And this way we can actually uh, keep track better of uh, what our models are learning, especially as we start to collect large numbers of these experiments. Okay, so back to uh, execute exp. Um, it's about time to do the real work. Uh, so um, here we're referencing that args.nogo uh, boolean. If that is true, then we're not going to execute the rest of this. We are uh, all done. Um, but if it is left in the false state, so if no go is not specified, uh, then we're going to start training. Uh, so let's go ahead and fill this in. Uh, we talked some about this in the collab example um, as to exactly how to uh, set this up. Um, but uh, let's go, we'll go ahead and work through it again here. So our set of inputs is ins, our set of outputs is outs. That we've created uh, epochs is specified by the args. All right, next argument is verbose. I'm going to set that to false, although sometimes it's useful to set that up as an argument as well. Uh, and we'll talk more about what this means. Um, but in order to use our callback, we need to use, specify this. In our callback list, this is our early stopping callback. Okay, with that, uh, we're done training. And the last thing we want to do is close out our, sorry, is to write out the results of this. You'll notice that model.fit returns a history object here. Uh, I want to write that history object out to a pickle file, which is just a serialized binary data file. So, so this is a format string here. Um, so results is the directory where our results will go. XOR results underscore uh, percent S has to be filled in. And I'm going to do that with arg string, which we created up above. So that came from uh, our args to string function up here. And we also have to specify that we're writing to this file and it's a binary file. So pickle.dump means uh, we're going to hit, we're going to send history.history .history to, uh, to the binary file. Oh, and we have to tell it which file it's going to. And let's also, it's also a good idea to keep track of the arguments that you are using for your particular experiment. And that makes it easier to reconstruct what has happened. Okay, so once those two objects have been written out to the file, then we can we can close out that file and our uh, experiment is done. So I'm gonna go ahead and save that in Emacs, that is control X, control S. And uh, at this stage, we have done everything. So the very top, we've done our build model. Uh, we didn't have to make changes to arg to string. We did most of our work within this e execute exp function. All right, so we've finished editing everything. And uh, the next step is to make sure that our environment is completely set up and then we'll try executing it. 